are above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end, forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell, period. Let's turn to her and pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin. Name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, in this session... I'm going to get about as basic as you can get. Uh, the, the name of the talk is reality, really. Reality. What's reality? Well, consummately, absolutely speaking, God is reality. He, he told us that when he, in a sense, gave, gave us his name, when he uh, told Moses. When God told Moses on the mountain, go tell the Israelites, I am who am, sent you. God revealed his nature and his name to Moses. I am who am, who am, Yahweh, I am who am. Now, Christian philosophy and theology has intuited from that to mean that God's very essence is to exist. Okay? God's very essence is to exist. God requires nothing for his existence. He, he's eternal, okay? Uh, God is eternal. He's all-powerful. He is the creator. Two classes of being, very simple. The creator and creation. God is the creator. Everything else is his creation. That's it. There is nothing else. That's it. Very simple, very clear. Our existence our being, our life, is what we call contingent being, dependent being. We depend on God for existence. I used to do a little exercise with people and say, all right, now I want you to trust me for a second here and do what I tell you to do. Now hold your breath. And don't take another breath until I tell you. <laughs> hold your breath. And then, you know, after 30 seconds or so or a minute, you're going to start feeling it. You're going to really want the next breath. You can't take it unless God gives it to you. That's contingent being. We depend upon God for everything. God depends upon nothing for his existence. Before the foundations of the world, God is. God never was. God never will be. God is. Absolute, pure, essential being. God doesn't change. God is immutable. That word means unchangeable. Why? Because God is eternally arrived. God is perfect. God is perfect. That which is perfect admits of no change. Only the imperfect, the created, can change. God isn't on the way, like us. God is eternally arrived, perfect, immutable, unchangeable. God doesn't change his mind about stuff. You know, it, it seems like he does sometimes, you know. Um, someone was talking to me earlier and said, oh, after, uh, maybe it was after 9-11 or some catastrophe, people said, well, God doesn't punish. Uh, well, you have to understand, uh, yes, he does. <laughs> you know, I mean, how, how simple is that? I mean, you know, oh, no, God would never punish him. Well, yeah, 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 God chastises every son he loves. If you don't believe that, you don't believe the Bible. Simple as that. It says so. God chastises every son he loves. Why? To get even? No, because he loves us. Because he loves us. He doesn't allow those evil things to hurt us. He's not trying to get vengeance on us. No. God does everything out of love. Uh, the classic example of it, I've told it many times. I've told all my stories many times. 
you, <laughs> a lot of you know that. But one time I was preaching somewhere, I don't even remember where, in a as often happens, a good mother came up to me. Good moms are always coming up to me, and dads. And mom said, Father, my, I, I'm having trouble with my son. Uh, he was a teenage boy, 16 or 17. And she said, oh yeah, I know he's headed for trouble. I know he's drinking, and he might be doing some drugs. Uh, could you talk to him? And, you know, I've had that so much. And I, I said, look, does he want to talk to me? Well, no. <laughs> but she was like that widow, you know, who wore out the unjust judge. You know, he finally had to give her what she wanted. Boy, she wore me out. She said, oh, please, Father, you have to do it. You know? I said, okay, bring him around tomorrow. So she did. Brought the kid in and left. And I was on my best behavior. I really was. <laughs> and I said, son, how can I help you? And he said, you can't help me. <laughs> I said, well, what can I do for you? You can't do a thing for me. And it went downhill from there. He was the most obnoxious, <laughs> hard-headed kid. Reminded me of me. <laughs> you know, you could see he was headed for big trouble. He'd probably end up in jail or prison, you know, like me. You know, I never ended up in prison, but, you know, I could have. I, 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 was, uh, I was just lucky, you know. I, I've, listen, I've preached in jails and penitentiaries. And I always tell the men or the women there, hey, the only difference between you and me is you got caught. <laughs> you know, I don't, uh, I don't pretend to be any better than anybody. But anyway, I was exasperated, you know. Finally, uh, I mean, he was really an obnoxious kid. It was really, I couldn't do a thing with him. So finally I said, okay, I'll just pray for you. And he, he, he kind of scoffed. He was a real wise guy. And he said, what are you going to pray for? I said, I'm going to pray God kicks your butt. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, you, you know, that was a kind of a strange, I never heard a priest say talk like that before. <laughs> he was probably a little semi-scandalized there, but, you know, that was the end of the conversation. And, off he went. A week later, the telephone rang. It was his mom. Oh, Father, a terrible thing has happened. My son has been in an awful car wreck. He's got broken arms and broken legs, and he's in the hospital. And I remember thinking a profound thought, yes. <laughs> and who said God doesn't answer prayer? <laughs> now, lest you get the wrong idea, I, I would never wish evil on anyone, but I would wish a change of heart on people. My, uh, let's put it this way. My old Uncle Tony used to say, some people have to be hit between the eyes with a two-by-four just to get their attention. And don't you think for a minute God won't hit you right where it hurts. He will. Well, that boy, he, he oh, you talk about a wreck. I went, to, I went to see him, you know, his mom asked me, he said, Father, would you please go visit him? And I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I did, I walked in, there he was, broken arms and broken legs, all, you know, he looked like the mummy, in traction, <laughs> IV bottle. And I stood at the foot of the bed, and he's just, his eyeballs were sticking out of the bandages. <laughs> and I just smiled at him. That's all. <laughs> I didn't say a word. <clears throat> and then I left. <laughs> and I came back to visit him from time to time. He had a long time to lay there and think about what a miserable human being he had been to his mom and his dad and his brothers and sisters and his friends. And you know, God worked on him through his hardship. God worked on him through his tribulation. You know, it, 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 he, he was in pain. 
He really was. You know, when you, when you get messed up that bad, you become familiar with pain. And in that pain, something happened to him. He was humble. You know, he, he couldn't move. He, j- he was, he w- and, and that's a frightening thing, uh, to be that debilitated. It humbled him. He became frightened. And for the first time ever, perhaps, although he'd been born Catholic, he turned to God sincerely. Because maybe for the first time ever, he knew he needed God. He knew that his very existence depended on God. And he became one of the nicest young men you could ever meet. And so that's reality. We begin with God. God's pure love, God's pure existence, life itself. And remember that as we go on throughout the course of the day because we have a knockdown, drag out, bare knuckles brawl going on between the forces of life and death. Ultimately, quintessentially, and absolutely speaking, God is life. I am who am. God, his very essence is to exist. That's reality. Uh, There are people who say, I don't believe in God. Um, they're, They're extreme cases. I honestly don't believe there are a large number of true atheists, but there are some. Now, there are a lot of people who act as if there were no God. Uh, But they don't really know. Most people aren't qualified to say, I don't believe in God. If somebody were to say to me, I don't believe in God, uh, and I had the power to do it, which I don't, except in those cases like that boy I told you about where I prayed for him, (laughs) I would say, okay, so you don't believe in God. I imagine there were a number of people who would say on September 10th, 2001, I don't believe in God. And then September 11th, the next day came along, wow, how fast they believe. Man, who, I'm a believer. You know, uh, I'll tell you what, close proximity to death brings reality into focus. No atheists in foxholes. You better believe it. When people get right to the edge of death, they're not such wise guys as they used to be. That softens them up, you know? Uh, A struggle with a serious illness for a year or two or three or ten. I have rarely met someone like that who didn't have faith. Oh, they may, may have started out atheist, they thought. But as time went on, and they learned their limitations, their frailty, their finitude. They knew they had to rely on God. Listen, if there's no God, we are in desperate trouble. But there is a God. That's where we begin. That's where all knowledge begins, with God himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All of the truths start there. The Trinity. That's the basic truth of our faith. And all other truths unfold from that, from that foundational truth. What about the rest of reality? Uh, We have had, in my lifetime, a headlong flight from reality. One of the earmarks of my generation is flight from reality. We try to get away from reality. Now, we can see this or be aware of this in certain conscious things and certain uh, subconscious things. I'll give you some examples. I'm 57 years old. Okay? That's not a particularly long space of time as time goes. Uh, many of you are the same age or, or older. We've seen quite a bit in our time. Those of you who are a little older than me, you've seen even more. I, you know, my mom's 80. She was 80 in, uh, in May this year, and um, she, she's seen uh, the Depression, the Great Depression, you know, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, all the technological changes. She was a registered nurse. Uh, she was uh, an officer in, in the Army 
um, when uh, World War II was going on. And she was um, stationed at a big hospital in New York City. And th that all the technology that she saw in the medical field, you know, from back in the 1940s up until when she retired after 45 years of, of nursing, um, amazing what's happened. Tremendous advances technologically, unbelievable regress in thinking, philosophy, theology, a flight from reality. You run from God, you run from reality. Even inside of religion, we've seen this. Uh, even inside of our own church, we have seen indications of this. I, I told you the funny story about that first time I preached, about how the, the, the rather well-known liberal theologian was saying, we don't believe in angels anymore, and we don't believe in, in the devil, and we don't believe in purgatory or hell. Uh, there was a, a theologian with a doctorate degree in theology who taught theology all up and down the West Coast. Uh, he formed many of the lay catechists on the West Coast, and uh, then he went on the East Coast after about 10 years of, of uh, undermining the faith out here. Uh, he was in, in an auditorium like this with a group of catechists, after he had given a lecture, a good Catholic woman said to him, Dr. So-and-so, do you believe in the angels? No. The devil? No. Do you believe in purgatory? No. Do you believe in hell? No. Do you believe in heaven? I don't know. <laughs> that's what he said. Now that's frightening. And it goes a long way toward explaining what happened in our church. And how did it happen? How was it allowed under the specious pretext of tolerance, we gave way to permissiveness. Just like parents who let their children get away with anything and everything. Oh, a lot of the priests and theologians were allowed to get away with just about anything and everything. And they taught immoral theology in certain places for years. And the people would ask them, troubled about this and that. Oh, just follow your conscience. Artificial contraception, abortion, homosexual relations. The seeds were sowed. They never told them you have an obligation to form your conscience. There's no such thing as conscience in a vacuum. Conscience is not an independent entity. It can do whatever it pleases. Conscience has to be formed to the objective norm of truth. And then conscience will guide you like a compass. But conscience, besides being well formed, can be malformed. And it can also be killed. You can kill, murder your conscience. And how do you do that? By refusing to listen to it. It comes as original equipment for every human being. And it says, do this, avoid that. Do good, avoid evil. That's the basic message of the voice of conscience. Do good, avoid evil. And when you start out as little children, it works. But when you start ignoring the voice of conscience, by the way, when you abuse your conscience, meaning you don't listen to it, in other words, you know right and wrong. There's an innate sense of right and wrong. Not in everything. Some things are easier to know than others. There, there are some things a little more complex. You have to learn. You have to be instructed. You have to be informed. And then you follow the voice of conscience. That, that, you know, when we say, well, you can follow your conscience, that presumes you've formed your conscience. That doesn't mean you can do anything that comes into your head. 
When I was living in sin in the bad old days, my mother used to say to me, doesn't your conscience bother you? And I would say no. <laughs> and it didn't. You know why? Because it was dead. I had murdered my conscience. You know, it begins when you tell a little lie when you're a kid and you don't repent of it. Or maybe you disobey mom. She says, now I don't want you going to that party. I can never come to that point in a talk without stopping and remembering. A day back in the early 70s, I had just gotten out of the Army. I was in college. And I was staying with friends on a Friday evening. The telephone rang. It was my sister, Carol, and she said, you better come home quick. Our sister's been in an accident, and it might be serious. And I drove right to the hospital, went in, my, my uncle was there, and I knew right away. And my sister had just turned 14, and she and four of her friends were killed in an automobile accident. What had gone on the previous week was a running battle that you parents are all too familiar with. Having just gotten into high school, my sister wanted to go to a football game Friday night. We played night games uh, in the high school we went to. And my mother said, all right, you're in high school now. You can go to the game. But I don't want you going in a car. You know, you walk up with your friends if you want, and then you walk home. But you're not, I don't want you going with kids in a car. Maternal intuition. Well, everybody's going to go in the car. And, and so it went, you know, all week, the battle. I don't want you going to go, but I want to go. Everybody's going, in, you know, whining, on and off, on and off. Friday morning, my mother leaves the house 6 a.m. as usual to go to her shift as a nurse. And she said to my sister, now don't you dare go to that game in a car. You can go with your friends, you can walk, but I'm telling you, don't go. I just... I, I just sensed something awful would happen if you did that. Please don't do that. She did, and she was killed. Now, my mother was not a permissive parent. She tried. She tried. Possibly, if she sensed she, she was going to disobey, maybe she should have locked her in her room. I don't know. You, you know, you think about those things. But, hey, it happened. What can you do? You can only do so much. There's reality to be dealt with. The reality of good and evil, right and wrong, truth and lies, light and darkness, life and death. That's absolute, in your face, consummate reality. And we have to be in tune with reality. Remember what I said last night. To be out of touch with reality is a good working definition of insanity. And that's the truth. Ask any psychiatrist. To be out of touch with reality is a good working definition of insanity. If you're out of touch with God, you're out of touch with reality. Now, now God has revealed himself to us. He has revealed the truth to us. Some of the things in recent years, and Fatima, by the way, pointed this out to us. You know, you, you, you can't help but think of the vision of hell that the children were shown. That's reality. Stark, frightening reality. Uh, I don't like to deal in those things. You know, I, I, I probably have somewhat of a reputation uh, because I mention those things. But don't think for a minute that I like talking about uh, hell. That's my least favorite thing to talk about, and I have spent less than a small part of 1% in my life ever preaching about that. But I'll tell you what, I would rightly consider myself pastorally negligent if I left it out altogether. That's part of reality. Remember this. Remember. <laughs> At the end, and it's coming fast, Oh, I don't know about the end of the world. I know nothing about that. I'm talking about your end. 
and mine, right? I mean, how long are we going to live? You know, a hundred years is less than the blink of an eye in the context of eternity. And so when you see the funny cartoon with the little guy with the placard saying the end is near, you better believe it. <laughs> I don't mean the end of the world. I mean your end and mine. It's coming fast. In the twinkling of an eye, we're out of here. And when that happens, you and I will be one of two things. A winner or a loser. Heaven or hell. Now. That's reality, and a lot of people just don't like it, and so they ignore it, and even in the church, we've ignored that reality, and I say much, much to the injury of souls. I don't want to dwell on it. You shouldn't dwell on it. God wills not the death of any sinner. God wills that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God wills that we be in heaven with him forever. Now that's reality. But we have a choice. We can decide to accept God's will or reject God's will. When we accept God's will, we accept basic morality. We accept the teaching of the church, the Ten Commandments, the moral life. This is not rocket science, and yet you might think it is for all the lack of understanding today. We've got people who are highly educated, highly intelligent, even in theology, and they're clueless, and they never say a word about these elements of reality that have been, as it were, bracketed out of the contemporary consciousness in the Christian and Catholic communities. Many places. Many places. You don't hear about it in sermons. But this is real. Purgatory. Do you think that's optional teaching? Not for Catholics, it's not. That's part of the doctrine of the faith. And somebody once said to me, well, how do you know there's purgatory? You ever been there? Whenever they say that to me, you know, when I get in those days, I, oh, I can never help but think of, the, of, of an old joke Bishop Sheen told, and you've heard me tell it before, and I just can't resist. <laughs> Forgive me for recycling old Bishop Sheen jokes. <laughs> but it's true, you know, they, they, they say, well, you, you've never been to purgatory. It's like the, a heckler at UCLA one time when Bishop Sheen was speaking there. Uh, he was talking about Jonah being in the belly of the whale, for three days, and the heckler in the back of the auditorium said, how do you know Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days? And Bishop Sheen, trying to be cool, you know, make a response, said, well, um, when I get to heaven, I shall ask him. And the, he and the heckler said, well, what if he's not there? And he said, well, then you ask him. Part of the doctrine of the faith, that's how I know it, okay? There is a purgatory. You can bet your life on it, and you better be thankful there is. Because if there's no purgatory, which means the final purification, you know, you have to be perfect. You have to be absolutely pure to stand in the presence of God, the, the beatific vision, the immediate vision of God. You've got to be perfect, perfectly pure. Uh, and well, maybe, maybe you are, but I'm not. <laughs> I thank God for purgatory. You know, if, if, if you don't get the job done here, then uh, God will get it done for you in purgatory. Anybody who goes to purgatory goes to heaven, guaranteed. You know, purgatory is just a stop on the way to heaven. But if there's no purgatory, and you're not absolutely perfect, the only other alternative... Now that's reality. That's reality. You better believe it. That's in your face truth. You say, I don't like that. Well, get over it. <laughs> that's the truth. Deal with it. 
You know, people, a lot of this stuff, I, I have, a, with you, I have an easy time. You're very fine people. I know where you're coming from. You know where I'm coming from. We get along just fine. But I'll guarantee you, if I went to the average Catholic parish in this country and preached the way I do, and I've done it many times, and believe me, I don't back off. Don't think for a minute that I talk to them any different than I talk to you. Things are received according to the mode of the receiver. If you're well disposed, you receive it well. If you're ill disposed, it drives you nuts. <laughs> These people hate my guts. I used to, go, when I did parish missions, someplace I'd have my, uh, my accomplice, I'd say, keep, keep the car running. We might have to make a quick getaway. <laughs> and, and, and what did I do? I just told them the truth. Why, why did it bother them? You know, remember ch chapter 8 of the Gospel of John is a kind of Magna Carta on truth. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, Why is it that you cannot bear my word? Why do you not understand what I say? I'll tell you why. Because you, you are of your father, the devil. Can you imagine if Jesus would show up today and preach in your average Catholic parish and make a statement like that, I know why you don't understand me. I know why you don't like what I'm saying. The devil's your father. Why they would send him to sensitivity training <laughs> so fast. Reality. Absolute reality. Listen, there is a God. God created everything out of nothing. Ex nihilo. Out of nothing. That's what creation is. God doesn't require anything to create. You know, we, we use the term in an accommodated sense, uh, an artist creates a masterpiece. But absolutely speaking, only God can create. Okay? Out of nothing. That's reality. Part of that reality is the angels. God created the angels. Pure spiritual beings. Messengers. Some of the angels rebel. The fallen angels. That's part of the doctrine of the faith. Let me tell you something. An awful lot of the pseudo-sophisticates, the pseudo-educated people, especially in the church, would have you believe these things aren't true. That there is no devil. I'll tell you something. And again, Bishop Sheen, in his great wisdom, he'll be canonized someday. He said, if God is the one who says, I am who I am, then Satan is the one who says, I am who I am not. All the enemy needs is for you to think he doesn't exist. And if the enemy doesn't exist, why resist? Why fight? Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. There's no spiritual combat. No hell. Ah, but there is. That's reality. We were reminded of that basic reality at Fatima. It's part of the message. The children were shown a vision of hell. Uh, our lady said one time, souls fall into hell like snowflakes. For there is no one to pray and do penance for them. She also said that more souls go to hell for sins against purity than any other reason. That is the most common serious sin. Now we've got a lot of sin, and that's not the only kind of sin. But just look at the world. Look at what's look, look at what's happening. When I was a boy, this was a very wholesome country, a very moral country. Um, in the early 50s, when television was pretty much new, think back. Think back what was on television 50 years ago. You remember. You know, Milton Berle. Howdy Doody. <laughs> Buffalo Bob. 
It was innocent, wholesome. Uh, There were sexual innuendos and worse wasn't woven into everything on television. There was no sex in the city. Can you imagine, think back, if they put stuff like that on television 50 years ago, in my grandma's day, when I was a boy, they would have locked them up and thrown away the key. You see, back then we had more sense, more common sense. Then what happened? We lost our vigilance. And under the specious pretext of freedom, we became slaves. It isn't freedom. It's license. You better understand the difference between freedom and license, for it is fundamental. License is doing whatever you want to do. Freedom is being empowered to do what you ought to do with the glorious freedom of the children of God. Jesus said the man who sins becomes the slave to sin. That's one of the worst consequences of serious sin. It enslaves you, makes you deaf and blind. And that's why millions and millions of people today just can't see it. They're morally blind and deaf. And being blind and deaf, they're all so dumb, they can't even speak a word in defense of the truth. This is reality. This is absolute, consummate, life and death reality. And it is your job and mine to be filled with this reality, to interiorize this truth, to allow it to strengthen you and empower you. Listen. We are the greatest nation on the face of the earth, but we've been slipping. We've been slipping in recent years. Technology is a great thing, but but technology is a level of science that is a lower science, lower than philosophy, lower than theology. Because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. Having the ability to do something, that's technology. Having the wisdom to know what to do with it, that's a higher science. That involves philosophy and in the highest, theology. You know, because we can clone a human being doesn't mean we should clone a human being. When uh, four ex President Bill Clinton wrote his book, and they asked him about his unfortunate affair that made us a laughing stock all over the world. Why did you do it? Because I could. Because I could. I had the power. I was in the position. Oh, he's repentant of it. I'm not, I don't want to beat up on anybody. Anybody can make a mistake. But very often, we make terrible mistakes. We do things just because it's possible. But everything that's possible is not necessarily good. This is reality. We, as Catholics and Christians, have an awesome gift. To the man who's been given more, more will be required, as the Bible says. To the man who's been given much, much will be required. The man given more, more will be required. We've been given much. We've been given more. With every gift, with every authority, comes a commensurate responsibility. We have an awesome responsibility. Cain killed Abel. God said, what did you do? Where's your brother? How do I know? Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. His blood cries out to me from the ground. We are our brother's keeper. Before this day is over, 
I'm going to talk a lot more about that. And I'm going to talk about blood. Blood that cries out from the ground for vengeance. The blood of the innocent. The blood of my brothers and my sisters. The most innocent, slain in the place that should have been the safest in the universe. Their own mother's womb. And their blood cries out. We are responsible, not just for our own actions, but for the actions of our brothers and sisters. Parents are, to a, a degree, responsible for the formation of their children. I know there's only so much you can do. You know, they get out of the house, they come of age, hey, they're going to do what they're going to do. You, you can only do what you can do. You don't have absolute power over them. I know. I know. And it's difficult to do. It's difficult. I am my brother's keeper. Before this day is over, I will say more than enough to lose my head. Guaranteed. But I have a soul to save, too. And I'm not going to lose it for any one of you, for any politician, or for any bishop. <laughs> not going to happen. I am my brother's keeper. And if I love my brother, and I must, that's a mandate from God. If I love my brother and my sister, and my brother or my sister is doing something self-destructive, something that's morally masochistic in a manner of speaking, if they're skipping and dancing merrily on their way to hell, in plain English, that's reality then it is not charity, it is not mercy, and it is not pastoral care to confirm them in their sin, either actively or through guilty silence. I have an obligation. I have an obligation in conscience because I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. And if I love them, I must care enough to open my mouth whether it's convenient or inconvenient, in season or out of season, accepted or rejected, we've got to tell the truth. We've got to preach the gospel, full-throated and unsparingly shouted from the rooftops. The day for inactivity and fence-sitting is over. For I tell you, it is imminent when the hand of Almighty God will reach down, take hold of the fence, and shake it with great power. No one will be left sitting on a fence. In the end, you will be for him or against him. You will be a defender of the truth or of lies. You will walk in light or in darkness. You will be on the path of life or death. For as the Bible tells us, two ways, and two ways alone are set before you, O man, the way of life and the way of death. Therefore, choose life. God bless you. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end, forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell, period. Let's, uh, as always, begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And gathering our voices together as one, let us pray in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, we're into the fourth sermon in this series on uh, Fatima today, Life for a Dying World. And this one's going to be uh, on penance. Now, I know I've already talked a little bit about that subject. All these things are interrelated, okay? Uh, you remember when the angel exclaimed to the children, penance, penance, penance. Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, the prefect for the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, re reminds us. Uh, he said this uh, concerning Fatima. Listen to Cardinal Ratzinger. He said, to save souls has emerged as the key word of the, sir, of the first and second parts of the secret of Fatima. And the key word of the third part is the threefold cry, penance, penance, penance. The beginning of the gospel and of Jesus' public ministry comes to mind. Jesus said, repent. And believe in the good news, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is also the message of all the prophets who led up to Christ. All right. That third, the famous that we wondered about for so long, you know, the third, so-called third secret of Fatima. Cardinal Ratzinger says that uh, part one and two, the first two uh, elements, to save souls. That's the, that's the key. And the third part is related to that, where the angel cried out, penance, penance, penance. All revelation, in order to be authentic, has to uh, subsist in what we call divine revelation. I'm going to just very briefly there are two kinds of revelation, public and private. Uh, public revelation, what we call divine revelation, that's the revelation of God our Father to us in the person of his Son, his only word. As St. John of the Cross said, God our Father spoke but one word in the eternal silences of the Trinity. His only word, Jesus. He has no more to say. That's divine revelation. The Father reveals himself to us in the person of his only word, the word of God. The word of God isn't something. The word of God is somebody. Jesus is the word of God. Sacred scripture, the Bible. Sacred tradition, capital T. It's not merely custom. Sacred tradition is one of the essential elements of divine revelation, equal in importance with sacred scripture. Now, what is sacred tradition? Uh, it's the apostolic kerygma. That, that's the teaching of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit that was given to the apostles who handed it down to the successors, the bishops, in union with the bishop of Rome, the pope. Jesus never wrote a book. Now, the Bible certainly has God as its primary author. No question about that. God's the author of the Bible. And that's divine revelation. But Jesus himself, when he walked in Palestine, he didn't write a book. <clears throat> he taught orally. That's the apostolic kerygma, that sacred tradition, the, the, the essentials of faith and morals. Whenever you have a word, <clears throat> written or spoken, you have to have an authentic and authoritative interpreter of the word. I guarantee you that I can take the Bible and make it say anything I want it to. It doesn't mean it says anything I want it to. But I can twist it and turn it, and if I'm dishonest, immoral, 
or lacking in understanding or education, and most of all, the, the Holy Spirit to help me, you can get everything. You can get anything you want out of there. You, you can justify murder with this. Oh, you can. It, it, you really can't, but you, you know, some people think they can. You can try. I remember preaching in Florida when I finished my doctorate. I was in Pensacola, and uh, I was uh, living at a rectory, and it was a very good priest, a friend of mine who was the pastor there. And uh, he was the head of uh, the pro-life office for the diocese at the time. And there was a particular man, uh, uh, he was a minister uh, of sorts, a Protestant minister, and he was uh, very zealous about pro-life matters. But he had no authority over him. And he, began, he, went o he went over the edge. And he began to preach that it was all right, that, and he used the Bible to justify it, that it was all right <clears throat> to do violence to abortion doctors in order to protect the innocent. Now, he went over the line. He was wrong. That's not true. You can't do that. You, you know, the, you, 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 a good end doesn't justify an evil means. Basic moral precept. You know, well, I, I'm going to protect the innocent, so I'm going to knock off a few doctors. No way. You can't do it. Can't. Anymore. Well, sure enough, it happened twice in Pensacola. Two doctors were shot. You've got to have an authoritative and authentic interpreter of the Word of God in order to stay in God's will, and that's the church, the magisterium of the church. That's the Holy Father and the bishops united to him in teaching the same teaching that Jesus taught to his apostles, who handed that on to their successors, the bishops, who are in union with the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. They can't make it up as they go along. The deposit of faith is something we've received. It's a pearl of great price. It's not a subjective construct. Not even the Pope can change the essential teaching of Jesus Christ. Uh, he can certainly interpret it. We can come to understand it better. But he can't change it in, in its essence. If, if someone were to come along and say, God is now uh, one God, four divine persons. <clears throat> not possible. <clears throat> not not going to happen. Can't happen. Uh, or what if the Pope said, and he never will, but what if the Pope were to say something like, well, you know, <clears throat> the Eucharist really isn't Jesus. Or the Blessed Mother really had several children, like some of the lame brain scholars have said. <laughs> Not true. Not true. Uh, the, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, you know, tells us that, that, that she had a singular privilege. She was a virgin before, during, and after the birth of her only son. Oh, but, but Jesus had brothers. Oh, please. <laughs> you know, we're recording this. And if somebody, somebody takes the recording and buries it in a time capsule, and they dig it up 100 years from now, and, and if I were to open one of my sermons and, and, and say, wow, we have 1,000 a, a people here, that's great. Well, my dear brothers and sisters, some moron a hundred years from now will say, he, wow, he had a lot of brothers and sisters. <laughs> Is that to be taken seriously? Come on. The use of language, and it was a common use, uh, Semitic language commonly used that term the way we do. It, it, could, it could mean friends, it could mean cousins. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean blood, brother. You know, that, that Mary had many children. 
You know, or they say, well, actually, when Jesus multiplied the loaves and fishes, well, it wasn't really a miracle. You see, the miracle was that he got, it to sh got them to share it with each other. <laughs> Happy horse manure. <laughs> it was a miracle in plain English. And the church affirms the miracles of Christ. You, know, you don't just give that some natural explanation, you know. Or, or some of the moronic books that have come out in recent years, you know, people pretending to know something about Scripture or, or about uh, theology, the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> Indeed. In case you don't know it, it's baloney. It's absolutely phony as a $3 bill. <laughs> I've just been talking about some of the reasons the angel says penance, penance, penance. We're in trouble. We need to pray. You know, almost 100 years ago, the messenger, the angel, said to the children, pray and do penance. Offer as many sacrifices as you can. Penance, penance, penance. You know, they'd seen hell. They had that horrible vision of hell. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I find a, something very interesting. As long as we're getting in trouble today, <laughs> we might as well go all the way. I find something very interesting that the pseudo-scholars, the pseudo-sophisticates, those of what we might call liberal persuasion, and I don't like that term because it's, it, it's not really an accurate kind of a precise term. The liberal and conservative, are, those are terms that came out of the French Revolution. Uh, they're political terms. They don't really have proper application in the matters of the church and in theology. We, we kind of know what they mean, though, so, you know, we use them. Uh, but, but you're either in the truth or you're out of it. You know, the devil's favorite color, by the way, is gray. In case you didn't know that. Now, don't get upset if you're wearing gray. I don't mean it that way. When I say the devil's favorite color is gray, that means he doesn't like black and white. You know what I mean? He does not like any absolutes, no moral absolutes. The denial of the objective order, the denial of moral absolutes, doesn't like it. Why? Uh, because if everything is gray, he has room to operate. Then just about anything goes. Oh, under certain circumstances, you can do this, you can do that, you can do the other thing. Oh, well, under those circumstances, oh, yes, you could have sexual relations if you weren't married. No, no, no. You could have that alternative lifestyle. No. You could have that abortion. Never. Never. There are certain things that are in themselves evil, intrinsically evil, as we say. I'm going to go into this more this afternoon. Penance, reparation, the salvation of souls. Look, I want you to think about something for a moment. Now, many of you are parents, grandparents. You know how much you can love a child. And you know that because of that love, how much you can suffer because of a child, you know? Now, I've never had, uh, I've never been married and had biological children, okay? So someone could say, yeah, well, you don't really understand. And in a way, okay, I've never had biological children, so maybe I'm at somewhat of a disadvantage in that sense. But God, in his very great goodness, uh, has given me a child and many children in a spiritual sense. And even, in, in, you know, sometimes spiritual things admit of a greater intensity of reality than merely physical things. 
Because something is spiritual doesn't mean it's less real. God is pure spirit, and he's absolutely real. The greatest reality. I remember when I was um, a novice, I was reading the readings at, on, at Sunday Mass, and in between the first and second reading, the choir was singing the response. And um, right in the first row was a very beautiful girl. And in that few seconds, there was uh, something uh, strange transpired. I, w I was getting close to vows, my first vows. And It was not a bad thing. It was a pure thing. It was a good thing, but something passed between us. I knew in an instant how beautiful a relationship between a man and a woman can be. How godly and beautiful two lives become one could be. And I knew in an instant that I would never have a wife. And I knew in an instant that I would never have children. I would never have a son. I would never have a daughter. And a terrible sadness overtook me. But almost instantly, uh, a, a, a tremendous joy pushed the sadness right out. And it was as if God spoke to me and said, don't worry. You're going to have a bride. I'm going to give you the most beautiful bride in the universe, my own. I'm going to give you the bride of Christ, the church. Every priest is taken up in Christ, the high priest. Jesus is the only priest. In an ordination, at ordination, the priest uh, is reconfigured to Christ, priest and victim. He becomes espoused to the mystical bride of Christ, the church. And it was as if Jesus himself insured me. He said, I'll give you a beautiful bride. And children, I will give you children beyond counting. And so it is. And so it is. And it's a beautiful thing. And so I have a dim intimation of what it means to be a father. You know, they call us father for a reason. It's not an empty, vacuous, inane term. If you're a father, you have to have children. You can't be a father unless you have children. That's the origin of the term, right? And so we have children. You know, St. Paul said, I often use this, by the way, with my Protestant friends and brothers and sisters when they say, well, we can't call you father. Because the Bible says, call no man your father. Then St. Paul was a heretic. Because he said, I am your father. I have begotten you through my preaching of the word. St. Paul told the people he was their spiritual father. How, how did he beget them? Through his preaching of the word. The word of God is potent. The word of God is brings forth life in the spiritual order. And so they call us Father. Celibacy. The faithful practice exercise of celibacy in the priesthood. Had a lot of talk about it, you know, in recent months and years. You know, all the horrible mess with the scandals, the sexual abuse thing. They say, oh, well, they should let the priest get married. Yeah, the, a, a, as my eminently uh, practical and wise assistant, Tamara, said when she heard that on television, she said, great, we'll let all the pedophiles get married. That'll solve all the problems. <laughs> Ridiculous, of course. That has nothing to do with anything, you know. If you can't be faithful to one vow, how are you going to be faithful to another one? The question of fidelity, that's all. Why do we have celibacy? It is a sacrifice, by the way, in a sense. 
I, I admit that. Listen, the older I get, when I was younger, I was a little, maybe I was a little bit too, too harsh, too tough on things, you know? Um, as I get older, I, I think I understand some things better. I sympathize with problems more. I sympathize with the loneliness of many priests. Many, many of us are lonely, you know? Uh, many priests, you know, we're with people a lot, but then, you know, you all go home together and we go home alone. So there is sacrifice involved there. There's supposed to be. There's supposed to be. That's part of that, that penance. But I sympathize with it. I sympathize with anybody's pain. I sympathize with the loneliness of our brothers, with the temptations they're, they're subjected to. So, so why? It's possible. Is it theologically possible for a married man to be ordained a priest? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we've had him from the, Peter had a mother-in-law. <laughs> he must have been married, right? In, in the beginning, at least, right? Well, he did. Uh, some of the apostles were married. Is it possible to ordain a married man? Yes. Is it possible for an ordained man to marry? No, never. Never was, east or west, never will be. But it's possible that we could ordain married men. Not everything that's possible is necessarily good. As I said before, why? Why do we have celibacy? Now, I'm talking about this in the context of sacrifice and penance, the angel's call to penance. The gift, and it is a gift, the gift of celibacy is given to individuals for a specific purpose. It's given to us in order to beget life in the spiritual order, in the body of Christ, to beget children, just as in marital love, the exchange of love between the spouses results in life, children. The exchange of love between the priest and the church in celibacy begets children. At a time in history when the body of Christ is in such dire need of an infusion of life, why should we throw back in God's face the very gift he has given us for the specific purpose of breathing spiritual life into the mystical body of Christ? Yes, it, it's a sacrifice. I know. Uh, it, it can be awfully difficult. I remember one time when I was younger, when I was first starting, <laughs> I think I was, a, I, I was a deacon about to be ordained a priest. And after Mass, I had preached at Mass, and a, a rather sophisticated, good-looking lady came up to me, and she said, she went like this. She goes, tsk, tsk, tsk. <laughs> she says, what a pity. I said, what, what do you mean? She said, what a waste. <laughs> I was younger then. And I said, excuse me? She said, well, you know, you can't have a wife. And she started in, you know? And, I, and I'll tell you, if the Holy Spirit had ever given me an inspiration, he gave me one at that moment, and I said, yeah, right, lady, I could be married to you. <laughs> Talk about penance. <laughs> I was confirmed in celibacy from that moment on. <laughs> Never looked back. But marriage is a beautiful thing. It's a magnificent thing. It's a great thing. I never understood that before. Until you don't have something and can't have something, you might not understand how beautiful it is. Uh, looking back, now I, I do understand. God gave me that understanding. Marriage is a gift. It's a sacrament. I mean, how, how great is that? One of the seven sacraments, it, it's magnificent. Often seminarians will come to me. I don't know if I can make that sacrifice. 
And, and I, I understand that. I understand the struggle here, but, and it is a sacrifice. But I tell them, look, look at it this way. Look at it this way. Marriage is a great thing. It's a fantastic thing. I mean, it's pure gold. But if you should have a chance one day to exchange gold for diamonds, what have you lost? Marriage is a great thing. But if you are called to something else, that's a greater thing. In other words, your happiness is what you're called to. I could never, I would be miserable if I were married. And so would my wife. I'll guarantee you that would be one miserable woman. Huh? Why? Well, not called to it. You have to have the grace that goes with your state in life. I, I know beyond any shadow of a doubt, I'm called to be a priest. It's the only thing I can do. The only thing I have any gift for. The only thing I could have any peace with. I'm not saying it doesn't have struggles. Constant struggle. Uh, the last three years have been hell. I don't mind telling you. Unbelievable. Difficult. I've been spit on because I'm a priest in the last three years. Literally. You know, it, it used to be a respectable thing. When I was a boy, I mean, we looked up to the priest in our parish. It was great to be a priest. We, we loved the priest. Now, I know people still love their priest. But in general, after the scandals especially, our stock went from high to low. I feel like a disenfranchised pensioner from Enron. I thought I was in Fat City, and then the bottom fell out. You know, once we had respect, now we don't, in most circles. Now, here it's different. You're a different kind of people, but you're not average. You don't represent the average population, even in the church. So we appreciate you, but sacrifice. We've got to remember we're called to penance. We're called to sacrifice. So the priest makes that sacrifice. Married people. Ah, what sacrifice is involved? Oh, it's a great thing. Uh, you love each other. You know, I, I remember when I was ordained. I was ordained by the Holy Father at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, uh, Vatican City. And uh, I, oh, I still remember it like it was yesterday. I, I, uh, I walked out of there. Sixty-two of us were ordained. We processed out. The Sistine Choir, two other choirs singing beautifully, you know, 10,000 people cheering. And that was my wedding day. Literally. I was, I floated out of there. I don't mind telling you. I just, I floated right out of there. I remember for months after that, I was ecstatic. I'd wake up in the middle of the night, and literally, it was a mystical thing, I believe. My, my soul was singing within me. I'm a priest. I'm a priest, thank God. I'm a priest. Uh, for months, it, it, uh, it was a honeymoon. <laughs> I mean, it was great. I was flying high. Really. And some of you, you remember married people. You remember how wonderful it was when you, when you were first married and, and, and how, how beautiful. And then, you know, time passes. And then one morning, you kind of wake up, foggy-minded, and you look over, and you say, Ah! What have I done? I work and I slave, I cook and I clean, and you don't appreciate me. Man, I travel, I run here, and I run there. I live in a suitcase. And what do I get for it? Mm. Yeah, you and me ain't so different. <laughs> there are days when we don't feel like going on. Whatever your state in life, whether, whether you're married, priest, religious sister, whatever. 
that we have our days, all of us. Oh, I don't mean we feel like running out on it, but, but you know, we can be tempted. I have been. I have been. More than once. And, and it's a struggle. It's a daily struggle. And, and I so often have to remember my grandmother's wise words. Johnny, offer it up. <laughs> you know, offer it up, boy. Just offer it up, you know. I mean, uh, I, I get it. On the one side, the world hates us. I don't know if I told you the story how when I finished that mission in St. Louis a couple years ago, when I went to the airport, I told you how the guy spit on me because I was dressed as a priest. Did I tell you about what the mother and the, did who had the little child? No? I tell these stories so much I don't remember from one weekend to the next, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I had just finished that the series of talks on the church, talked about the scandals, tried to help people deal with it. woman uh, at my gate at the airport, she had a little baby on the floor. Common sight in airports, a little child. I don't know, I'm not good at guessing ages, but six months maybe. The, the child couldn't walk yet but was get at that point where could prop himself up on his hands, you know how babies do, and kind of look around and see what's going on. And baby spotted me, you know, and looked at me and broke out in a big smile, beautiful, beautiful smile. It's a great thing. And uh, you can't help but smile. It's a child, make your day, you know. Well, mom snatched that baby up so fast and glared at me like a mother lion, as if to say, don't you even look at my child. You're one of them. You're one of them. And she stormed off. There is sacrifice involved in every state in life. You know, when I travel with a man, they said he's a homosexual. Travel with a woman, some of them will say, hmm, wonder what that's about. <laughs> Little child come up, they try to they hug you, you know. I can't help but think. I wonder who's watching or what they're thinking. You can't be seen with a man, a woman, or a child as a priest. Really. You can't be seen with a man, woman, or child. Where does it leave you? It leaves you cut off in a corner. That's where it leaves you. Exactly where the devil wants you. I've been around just long enough now that priests are beginning to speak to me about their problems. I guess I've gotten enough notoriety now that enough priests here and there know who I am, and they'll talk to me about their struggles. And I've talked with a lot of priests in the last couple of years. The morale is possibly the lowest it's ever been in the priesthood. You're getting it from the world, pounded, rejected. Because of, well, we, I, I am my brother's keeper. And I have to say I am responsible in a way for the sins of my brother. Even though uh, we may not have ever done any of those horrible things you see in the medium, we bear a certain responsibility. You know, we're in the, we're in the same boat. I'm going to talk a lot about this in the last talk this afternoon about how you can participate in the sins of another. In the catechetical tradition of the church, there are nine traditional ways given on how you participate in the sin of another. You'll see where I'm going with that this afternoon. But sacrifice, so essential. How did Jesus effect redemption? From a cross. From a cross. It, it, he, he was a preacher. They called him rabbi, it means teacher. He certainly preached, he, he taught. He, he was a prophet and the consummation of all prophecy. He was a king. 
greatest king, but not of an earthly kingdom. Priest, prophet, and king. Yes, Jesus. That's, he was all of those things. But above all, he was a victim. Above all, priest and victim. Why was Jesus in, incarnated? Why was he born? Why did he enter time and space? One reason. Redemption. Redemption. How did he effect redemption? Through his passion, death, and resurrection. The paschal mystery. And he said, the servant is no better than his master. Where I am, there my servant will be. And you look at a cross and you see him lifted up. It is necessary that I be lifted up in order to draw all men to myself. Penance, penance, penance. It gives power to prayer. No spirit of sacrifice, no power. I remember when I was looking into religious life, when I was discerning my vocation, I, I felt only called to the ancient orders, Franciscans, Dominicans. And I went to several different religious orders. And I would talk to the vocation director. And they would tell me, well, we don't have to wear the religious habit anymore. Um, we go to movies. We go to the beach. Uh, we do this. We do that. We do the other thing. And I'd listen. And, and it was, they, they began to sound like recruiters, like college recruiters or job recruiters. And, and they were trying to convince me what a good time I could have if only I would join them. And I remember thinking at the time, why on earth would I join you? If I want to be worldly, why don't I stay in the world? Why would I join you? And apparently a lot of others have asked that question too because they don't have any vocation. And it's amazing that all of the religious institutes, the ones with the toughest life, the ones with the greatest penance and sacrifice have all the vocations. Missionaries of charity. Oh, you know, Mother Teresa, I knew her a little bit. And um, I knew the, a lot of the, her sisters. I still know them. And um, I'll tell you what. They are the, they are the special forces in God's army, man, they are tough. Mother Teresa had a military mind. <laughs> in case you didn't know that. Oh, she did. And she went, you know, I'll tell you how tough she was. Uh, any, any sister, she'd, she'd go through the different missions with her, you know. And she'd spot a sister who wasn't smiling, working with the poor. And she'd take the, cut the superior and say, Just like that. Or if she did it herself, she'd take the sister aside and said, Sister, you don't have a vocation here. Because you're ministering to Jesus and you can't even smile. You don't have the gifts you need to deal with the poor. Go someplace else. Absolutely brutal in that sense. Oh, she wasn't brutal. She was holy and, and beautiful. But, but she knew what she wanted. She knew what she needed. Oh, she was a general. I remember the first time I went in one of the convents, there was a big map of the world on the wall. They have a little room off the chapel where the priests always go, any place in the world that I've ever gone where they are. And I asked uh, one of the sisters, Sister, what is that map? She said, well, that's the map of the world. I said, I know that. But what are all those pins <laughs> in that map? They had all colored pins, you know. It, it, it reminded me, uh, when I was in the Army, it reminded me of the war room that we had. And uh, sister said, well, you see, that's, mo that's mother's idea. Uh, just give you, I'd tell you a little bit about mother's mind. So that's the map of the world, and every one of those pins represents one of our houses. You see, we've got four over here in uh, Guatemala, and we've got so many over here. And you see, you see, mother considers the world all territory to be taken for Christ. 
Now, if that's not a military mind, I don't know what is. And, 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 and she knew how to do it. You know, if you're going to be, a, if you're going to, you know, take ground in a military campaign, uh, you better know what you're doing as a soldier. And she knew, and she knew about sacrifice. You can't do without. Bottom line, no sacrifice, no power. We have lost the sense of penitence and sacrifice. And because, it, because of it, Satan has a stranglehold on the world and even the church. We're averse to sacrifice. And so when the going gets tough, priests, religious, and married people are apt to bail out. Why? Too hard. Don't want to have to put up with any suffering. It's the only way you can be sacrificed. Don't run from the cross. To run from the cross is to run from Christ. To run from Christ is to run from love. To run from Christ is to run from salvation. Don't run from the cross. It's the only way. And I'll tell you something. If you have a, a love for your children and your grandchildren, a love for your friends, a love for your flock, Love for your priest. Offer everything you can as a sacrifice. Penance, penance, penance. Often in the night, I'll wake up sweating, scared. In the faces of all the drug addicts and alcoholics, will be arrayed before me. And I'll be moved to pray for them. I'll be forced to pray for them. And I do pray for them. And Jesus, through the power of his spirit, sets captives free. Sets captives free. He came to set the captives free. Why have we come? What are we about? The clock is ticking. The approach of midnight. Darkness deepens. Evil holds sway. And what are we doing about it? Penance, 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 the angel said. Don't act like there's no war in process. Get with it. Get with it. Pray and do penance for poor sinners, for our country. Everybody should be a patriot. Every one of us should love our country very deeply. Pray for your country. Remember what the, the angel of peace said. Pray. Pray and do penance. And if you do this, you will bring peace to your country. Pray the rosary every day. Offer little sacrifices. Do it like St. Therese. Little flower, doctor of the church. She said, I, I, I can't do great penances like the great saints. I'm too little. So, so she said, Jesus, I, I give you my littleness. I exchange it for your greatness. I can't do any great penances, so let me do little things with great love. In the little way. A way to make saints right here and right now. And so the little things of life, offer them up. Offer those sacrifice, sacrifices. Pray that rosary. And I promise you, very quickly, this battle will be finished. Very quickly, the dust will settle and the smoke of battle will be blown away. Time will give way to eternity. You'll stand before God. He'll smile at you, and you'll hear those beautiful words. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Now at last, enter into the joy of your master's house.
is Father John Carapi. I just want to take a moment to thank you for watching our programming on EWTN and to remind you that for a complete catalog of all of our media materials, books, DVDs, and CDs, check out our website, fathercarapi.com, or call the number on the screen. Also, we have a very exciting new video streaming service on our website. This is the only way that I have really to keep in touch with you on a weekly basis now that I'm not traveling so much. So check that out at fathercarapi.com. God bless you. Through their talents, their calling, and their testimony, they're living Catholic lives. Next on EWTN. Hello, friends. I'm Janet Benkovic, host of The Abundant Life.